Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Nordenberg. I have the privilege to serve as chair of Pitt's Institute of Politics and director of its Dick Thornburg Forum on Law and Public Policy. Uh, and it is in that latter position uh, that I extend a welcome to all of you today. Uh, and in extending that welcome, let me make clear that I'm including everyone who is here with us in the Teplitz Memorial Courtroom, uh, and also the 250 registrants from far and wide uh, who are joining us on the live stream. Uh, the fact that Dick Thornburg graduated from Pitt Law uh, is a source of great pride for all of us who are associated with the school because he was such an extraordinarily accomplished, impactful, and principled professional. Uh, among the many important positions that he held uh, were United States Attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division, two-term Governor of Pennsylvania, uh, United States Attorney General under two presidents, President Reagan and President George Herbert Walker Bush, and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. As if that is not enough, uh, what really stood out about Dick was not the number of positions that he held, uh, but instead the good that he did from each and every one of those positions. Uh, and there is one accomplishment that needs to be highlighted today, uh, and that is he led the efforts of the administration of the first President Bush to secure passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, that law has been called the last great piece of civil rights legislation in this country. Uh, on a more somber note, it also has been said uh, that such a piece of legislation probably could not make it through the Congress today. Uh, Dick is not the only member of the Thornburg family to have earned national and international recognition uh, for work in the field of disability. Uh, his wife, Ginny, the former first lady of Pennsylvania, uh, and someone who has joined us in the front row here today, uh, also earned great respect here and abroad for her work on disability issues, which she once described as her whole life's work. In fact, it was when Dick and Ginny jointly received the 2003 Henry Betts Award from the American Association for People with Disabilities uh, that they chose to take the monetary prize accompanying that award uh, and donate it to the university to see the creation of this annual lecture series. Uh, the Thornburg's commitment to this area uh, was not academic. Uh, instead, when he was less than a year old, uh, their son Peter was seriously injured in an automobile accident and left with physical and intellectual disabilities. In describing Peter's impact on her, Ginny has said that it was the certain emotional attachment that parents have that first caused her to become involved in disability issues. That sense of family connection uh, provides a bridge to this year's winner of the Thornburg Forum Disability Service Award, uh, a very special form of recognition uh, that is announced at this lecture each year. Uh, the award is presented to a Pitt student uh, from any level of study, any department, school, or campus 
uh, whose service has made a difference in the lives of children and adults with disabilities. Uh, Lee Culley, the Director of Disability Resources and Services at Pitt, uh, is here today. Uh, Lee, Jenny Thornburg, uh, and Kim Carson, the program manager for the Thornburg Forum, uh, play a big role in promoting and selecting uh, the recipients for this award, and so I do want to thank them. Uh, now, I'm going to ask Zachary Miller, uh, who is this year's winner, to come and stand up here somewhere near me so you can all see who it is that I'm talking about when I share some of the contributions and accomplishments that uh, have led to his recognition today. Uh, inspired and informed by his firsthand experience, as I indicated, with the challenges faced by an older brother uh, who is autistic uh, and a younger sister who is autistic, uh, this year's Thornburg Award winner, uh, an undergraduate from the Department of Bioengineering in our Swanson School of Engineering, uh, has been driven not only by a desire to support his siblings, but to have a positive impact on the neurodivergent community. Uh, one of his major accomplishments among many was founding SNAP, the Spreading Neurodiversity Acceptance Project, uh, with the mission of facilitating interactions between neurodivergent and neurotypical individuals on an equal footing. Another is reflected in the fact that his research was the subject of professional presentations uh, at the 2022 Biomedical Engineering Society Conference in San Antonio, the 2023 Biomedical Engineering Society Conference in Seattle, uh, and the 2023 Institute of Electrical and Electronic uh, Engineers, MIT, Undergraduate Research Technology Conference. Uh, one of his references, Professor Arash Mabubin, the Associate Chair for Undergraduate Education in the Department of Bioengineering, described these presentations as magnificent feats uh, for someone at his stage of education. The professor went on to say, while maintaining his commendable academic performance and engaging in meaningful research, Zachary finds time to enrich our university community through active participation and leadership in such programs as SNAP, PALS programs, the American Medical School Association, and the Student Government Board. In addition, as a disability ambassador and fall prevention volunteer at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Zachary exhibits an acute and genuine awareness of a concern for those around him, assisting patients with disabilities to ensure that they are properly accommodated and their safety guaranteed in the hospital setting. Our honoree founded Zachary Miller's tutoring service for math and science, a virtual teaching service to assist students with their coursework with particular attention paid to students with learning disabilities. He also has continued to pursue his goal to contribute to the field of autism by devising a method to enhance communications with his siblings. To that end, he has created a device capable of learning and interpreting speech across different neurotypes, working with others, particularly software engineers in the geriatric psychiatry neuroimaging lab, he has developed a neural network model 
that can analyze the patterns of stress and intonation of speech in any neurotype and grasp the nuances of their communication, subsequently translating their speech into a different neurotype, effectively breaking down communication barriers. Current plans call for a rollout of this device in 2025, which by my math is not very far away. Uh, Professor Harvey Borowitz, the former chair of the Department of Bioengineering and clearly one of the truly distinguished faculty members in this university, closed the lengthy letter that he submitted on Zachary's behalf by stating, our Department of Bioengineering is this year celebrating its 25th anniversary and over the years, we have graduated more than 1,600 students total at the BS, MS, PhD, and MD, PhD levels. I don't recall another student with as much enthusiasm, zeal, determination, and energy to make a difference in the lives of others than Zachary Miller. Uh, Dr. Borowitz continued to say, uh, <laughs> Zachary's intellect, his zeal, and his commitment to helping others make him, I believe, the type of student who would be a most worthy recipient of the Dick Thornburg Disability Service Award. Uh, the selection committee quite obviously enthusiastically agreed with that assessment. Uh, I should add that this award carries with it a $5,000 cash prize. Uh, Zachary has said that he intends to use this award not only to sustain ongoing projects, but also to utilize the funds to generate more opportunities for neurodivergent individuals through additional community events and innovative projects. Please, again, join Ginny Thornburg and me uh, in congratulating Zachary and thanking him for all that he already has done uh, and for wishing him the best in all of the good things that lie ahead. Congratulations. <laughs> How is that for a spark to get you thinking better about life and the people around you? Uh, and there is more to follow. Uh, I should say that uh, nearly 20 years ago, uh, it was Pitt's good fortune to persuade then Professor Mary Crossley uh, to leave the Florida Bar Health Law Section Professorship at Florida State University uh, to journey north and to become our dean. Uh, she served in, with distinction in that role for seven years, uh, stepping down as in 2012. Uh, in fact, she did such a good job that she has been yanked back into the uh, position uh, and currently is serving as interim dean of the school. Uh, in 2013, uh, the year after she stepped down as dean, uh, she was selected as a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Public Health Law Scholar in Residence. From 2014 to 2015, she served as a faculty mentor for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Future of Public Health Law Education Faculty Fellowship Program. In 2016, she was elected to the American Law Institute. In 2020, uh, she was appointed to the Pennsylvania Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And just last year, uh, she was awarded the J. Healy Teaching Award by the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. 
uh, Dean Crossley's book, Embodied Justice, Race, Disability, and Health, was published by the Cambridge University Press. Richard Besser, the president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, described it in the following way. Embodied Justice is an incredibly powerful and important book. It is important reading for anyone trying to understand the history and current state of health justice in America. If we truly believe that everyone deserves a fair opportunity for health and well-being, we must understand the inequities faced by Black people and people with disabilities in America and how those inequities are compounded for Black people with disabilities. Dana Bowen Matthew, uh, the dean of the George Washington University Law School, added these thoughts. Professor Mary Crossley has made a stunning contribution, advancing the literature on and understanding of health disparities in America. Uh, this is a must read for educators, healthcare providers, legislators, and everyone seeking to advance health equity in this country. Well, if her book is a must read, uh, then Dean Crossley herself must be a must hear. Uh, I should say that she has been a great supporter of this lecture series over the course of many years, particularly during her years as Dean. Uh, and so it is a particular pleasure to have her back in this spotlight role today. Uh, and it is a privilege to present Dean Mary Crossley. Thank you for that kind introduction, Mark. Um, I have long admired Dick and Jenny Thornburg as both advocates for the rights and welfare of people with disabilities and simply as inspiring people. So it's really both an honor and a delight to be invited to give the Thornburg Lecture this year. The title of my talk is Race Disability Intersectionality as a Health Equity Imperative. And I know that's kind of a mouthful. So my goal today is, is to help that make some sense to you. And in doing that, I will be relying heavily on the book um, that, that um, Chancellor Nordenberg referenced embodied in justice, race, disability, and health. And I started writing this book in earnest in January of 2020, really before, at least before COVID-19 was, was on my radar screen. But as I was immersed in researching and writing the book, COVID-19 erupted in the US and around the globe. And the stories that came out of COVID-19 really reinforced in some of the most terrible ways the relevance of the project I was working on. So many stories from the pandemic illustrate some of the points I make in my book. Many of the stories are hard to hear, but I'll share just one of them um, today to get us started. And that's the story of Michael Hickson, who died on June 11, 2020, from complications of COVID-19. Michael Hickson was a 46-year-old black man, the father of five, he had had a career as an auto insurance claims estimator until it was cut short when at the age of just 43 years, he experienced sudden cardiac arrest. Complications left him with quadriplegia, blindness, and brain injuries. Although he had difficulty speaking and remembering things, Michael Hickson continued to participate in his family's life, joking with his children and talking with his wife about their lives. He contracted COVID-19 and was transferred to a hospital in Austin, Texas. And as with many people hospitalized with COVID, the course of Michael Hickson's illness was difficult. He developed pneumonia, a urinary tract infection, and sepsis. And just three days into his hospital stay, his medical team communicated to his family that in the physician's opinion, continuing to treat Michael would be futile and that he should begin receiving hospice care. His wife, Melissa Hickson, his wife of 18 years, rejected the medical team's suggestion that it was time to throw in the towel on her husband's treatment. 
She agreed that he should not be intubated, but she thought that he would have a chance to live if he continued to receive less aggressive and invasive treatment for COVID. In a conversation recorded by Mrs. Hickson, she asked her doctor's hus- her husband's doctor why continuing to treat his COVID-19 would be futile. The doctor responded, quote, because as of right now, his quality of life, he doesn't have much of one. Mrs. Hickson asked, what do you mean? Because he's paralyzed with a brain injury, he doesn't have quality of right- life? The doctor replied, correct. Over his wife's objections, the hospital withdrew treatment from Michael Hickson and put him in hospice care. After six days, without any treatment for COVID, he died. Multiple news outlets told the story of Michael Hickson's um, demise after the hospital withdrew treatment from him. But those accounts did not, and and they probably couldn't, offer a fully fleshed out account of Michael Hickson's life and its richness his relationships with his wife, his children, and his friends. The accounts also didn't, and again, they probably couldn't. They didn't address the questions that I was haunted, that haunted me after hearing his story. Would Michael Hickson have survived COVID-19 and gone home to his family if the hospital hadn't discontinued treatment but had continued to treat him? Or would he have died even with continued treatment? More pointedly, would the hospital have insisted on withdrawing treatment if Michael Hickson had not had cognitive and physical disabilities? Would it have insisted on withdrawing treatment over his wife's objections if Michael Hickson had been a white man? So back to living through the pandemic and writing my book. The the connections between race-based and disability-based health inequities have puzzled me for many years. I became a law professor just a year after Dick Thornburg helped with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And most of my earliest research explored how disability discrimination law might apply in various healthcare and health policy settings. And as I wrote about disability health and discrimination, I learned that people with disabilities in the United States experience many health disparities. And this term health disparities refers to adverse differences in health status or outcomes or healthcare experiences that are linked with economic, social, or environmental disadvantage and that affect groups that have been systematically disadvantaged. So health disparities are evidence of health injustice. Compared to non-disabled people, disabled people are more likely to experience chronic health conditions like diabetes, asthma, and cardiac disease. Women with disabilities get screened for breast cancer and cervical cancer at lower rates than non-disabled women, just to give you a few examples of disability-based disparities. But researchers, physicians, and policymakers in the United States have paid less attention to health disparities experienced by people with disabilities than they have to racial and ethnic health disparities. But as I really focused initially on health inequities affecting disabled people, I increasingly learned how those inequities are just one strand of a much larger fabric of disparities and inequities experienced by black and brown communities and other groups that our society has marginalized. And as I began to study health-related injustices experienced by black people in particular, I started discerning what seemed to be parallels or similarities to the health-related inequities experienced by disabled people. A core similarity was that at the root of both were deeply ingrained and erroneous assumptions about bodily difference and inferiority. And that's what the title of my book, Embodied Injustice, tries to express, that health-related injustices endured by Black and disabled people flow in part from unfounded beliefs that there's something about the bodies and minds of disabled people and Black people that is intrinsically different and somehow inferior as compared to the white, abled bodies that the medical profession, the healthcare system, and society more broadly have established as norms. And as I studied even more, I realized that it's also critically important to consider how the experiences and identities of being black and being disabled intersect 
in the lives of people who are both black and disabled. So I'm gonna to start today by giving you just one example of one of the parallels that I explore in my book, um, parallels between um, people with disabilities and black people and the healthcare system. And that is the example of medical distrust. This is a big topic, um, but I'll just give you some highlights this afternoon. And the starting point is really that trust matters to medical outcomes. Distrust of the medical system can affect a person's decisions about whether to seek medical care, how much to disclose to a healthcare provider, and whether to follow the medical um, advice received. So it's long been recognized that medical distrust can lead to, or can at least contribute to, poor health outcomes. But for a long time, the initiative to try to address medical distrust, particularly among Black people, viewed it almost like it was a vitamin deficiency, and you just needed to correct the vitamin deficiency by fixing the distrust. Recently, that conversation has begun to shift so that conversations today are more likely to identify the problem as a dearth of trustworthiness on the part of the medical and scientific communities. The sources of medical distrust among Black people and disabled people are complex and have many dimensions. So today I'm just going to um, highlight a shared history of being subjected to non-consensual medical experimentation and current day experiences of disregard and devaluation within healthcare. Medical apartheid is the title that author Harriet Washington gave her sweeping history of medical experimentation on black people in America. The book reveals a longstanding and pervasive willingness among scientists, doctors, and the government to exploit black bodies so as to further white goals that include a tangled mix of medical knowledge, power, and profit. Washington describes the well-known um, Tuskegee study, which ran from 1932 to 1972, and was sponsored by the U.S. Public Health Service, along with other institutions. The decades-long study examined untreated syphilis in black men, and it withheld penicillin from men, some of who are pictured on this slide, even when that effective treatment became available. But Washington argues in her book that the Tuskegee study should be understood as emblematic rather than as an isolated occurrence. The medical record, or I'm sorry, the historical record also includes surgical experiments that J. Marion Sims, whom some call the father of mon modern gynecology, performed on numerous enslaved women in the 1850s. And this is a statue of Sims that long stood in Central Park. The goal of the surgery was to figure out how to repair vesicovaginal fistulas. These were injuries from childbirth that caused uncontrollable incontinence. And Sims developed his surgical technique through trial and error, operating at least 30 times on one woman named Anarka alone. Ether was not yet in common usage, so the women received no anesthesia during these repeated experimental surgeries. Recent debates about the ethics of Sims' surgeries have kind of a Rorschach test quality to them. Apologists portray Sims as a product of his time and laud how the knowledge he developed ultimately contributed to helping women with the condition. Critics denounce Sims as personally profiting from the pain that he caused to enslaved women who were entirely powerless to withhold their consent or to seek medical treatment for their condition. And this is a protest, um, a picture of protesters at the statue of Stems, and their protest eventually led to its removal from Central Park. However it's portrayed, though, I think Sims' career exemplifies a broader pattern of white men assuming control over Black women's bodies for their own purposes. But I like to close this story by sharing this photo of a monument to the enslaved women on whom Sims experimented. This statue was erected in Montgomery, Alabama in 2021, and it's titled The Mothers of Gynecology. Black people have also long undergone more mundane devaluation and discrimination in medical settings. 
Decades after civil rights laws ended legal segregation in healthcare facilities, many Black people in the United States still receive health care in facilities that are de facto segregated. And Black people today regularly experience that they are treated differently from white people by health care professionals. In a 2020 survey, seven in 10 Black Americans said that the healthcare system treats patients unfairly based on race or ethnicity, either very or somewhat often. And one in five Black adults reported experiencing racial discrimination when getting health care for themselves or their family member in the past year. In short, contemporary experience kind of layers onto historic exploitation and devaluation to give Black Americans good reason to be suspicious of doctors in the healthcare system. And research documenting better outcomes when Black patients are treated by Black doctors give credence to those suspicions. A stunning example can be seen in a 2020 study finding that the mortality rate for Black babies was cut in half when Black doctors cared for those infants. And that effect showed up even more strongly in complicated cases. Like Black people, people with disabilities also have a history of being subjected involuntarily to medical research. And in many cases, that research occurred in state-run institutions where disabled residents had no power to refuse to participate and where degradation and mistreatment of residents were endemic. The 1972 expose of horrific conditions at Willowbrook State School for children with intellectual disabilities is probably best known. Beyond its squalor, Willowbrook was the site of experiments that Dr. Saul Krugman performed on disabled children. In the name of searching for a cure or a vaccine for hepatitis, Krugman extracted hepatitis virus from the feces of six infected Willowbrook residents and used it to infect other children living at Willowbrook by putting it in their food. Krugman, like Sims, has his defenders. Some scholars defended Krugman because he obtained consent from the parents of the child subjects, as well as independent reviews. And his research, in fact, contributed to the development of the hepatitis B vaccine. Other ethicists, however, argue that no amount of knowledge gained can be justified, um, can justify intentionally infecting disabled children with a potentially deadly virus. One critic wrote to the medical journal, The Lancet, if Krugman and colleagues are keen to continue their experiments, I suggest that they invite the parents of the children involved to participate. I wonder what the response would be. Like Black people, disabled people experience discrimination and disregard in more mundane interactions. Seeking medical care routinely entails barriers and indignities for people with disabilities, even decades after the ADA's passage. Research published in 2018 reported that among 250 specialist physicians who were asked to accept the referral of a hypothetical patient with partial paralysis and who used a wheelchair, fewer than 10% had appropriate equipment or trained employees who could help examine a patient with a disability. This lack of accessible equipment and appropriate training keeps patients who use a wheelchair from being weighed or properly examined or accessing or receiving screening tests like pap smears or mammograms. Moreover, disabled people describe how doctors still express views of disability as a flaw needing medical correction. Research going back decades documents that many physicians tend to believe that disability causes diminished enjoyment of or satisfaction with life, when in fact, surveys of people with disabilities show them to be about as satisfied with their lives as non-disabled people. Bill Peace's story offers a chilling illustration of how physicians may fail to appreciate the value of continued life to a disabled person. An anthropologist and disability rights advocate who used a wheelchair, Peace wrote about an encounter he had when he was hospitalized with a life-threatening wound infection. At the time, Peace was medically stable, but was vomiting and had a high fever when at 2 a.m. in the morning, he was visited by a physician whom he'd never met before. Alone with peace, the physician detailed the medical, social, and financial challenges of continuing to, to treat peace's wound. 
Then the physician told Peace he could discontinue the antibiotic treatment needed to save Peace's life and assured him that if Peace chose that route, he could be made very comfortable. Peace rejected the suggestion. Later, after recovering from his wound, he described that night, quote, my fear was based on the knowledge that my existence as a person with a disability was not valued. Many people, the physician I met that fateful night included, assume disability is a fate worse than death. In a visceral and potentially lethal way, that night made me realize I was not a human being, but rather a tragic figure. Out of the kindness of the physician's heart, I was being given a chance to end my life. Peace insisted that his suspicion and fear were not unique. Again, I quote, most people with a disability fear even the most routine hospitalization. We do not fear any of the commonplace indignities that those without a disability worry about when hospitalized. Our fear is prime. Will our lives be considered devoid of value? Now, these experiences of um, Black people and people with disabilities experiencing um, that, that led to medical distrust, they're not the same. They're not identical, right, to be sure. But they have a similar effect, indicating that Black people's and disabled people's shared wariness of medical practitioners and researchers is a sensible response to unspoken and explicit messages conveyed over decades and centuries. Now, the stories that I've been telling so far largely involve interpersonal interactions where health professionals have biased views of Black people or disabled people. And biased actions at the interpersonal level can produce um, very real health harms. But I would argue that the health-related harms caused by structural racism or ableism are even greater. And, and let me tell you what I mean when I talk um, about racism or ableism. In basic terms, we can define racism as the assignment of people of color to inferior status and treatment based on unfounded belief about their innate inferiority, along with the unjust treatment of people of color, whether it's intended or not. Ableism, I think, is a term that's less widely recognized, but we can define it by substituting disabled people for people of color in the definition I just gave you. So the definition of ableism <clears throat> would, excuse me, would be that the, it would be the assignment of disabled people to inferior status and treatment based on unfounded beliefs about their innate inferiority, along with intentional or unintentional unjust treatment of them. Now, I know that for some people, um, bringing up racism can be a conversation stopper or can provoke defensiveness, but I think that's because of a mismatch in understandings of what the term encompasses. Certainly one form of racism is the hateful or malicious or overtly biased attitudes that some people exhibit towards Black people or other people of color. But it can also include unconscious race-based biases that people may not even be conscious that they have. Both overt racial malice and implicit bias are forms of what we could refer to as interpersonal racism. The other category of racism that's actually more important than interpersonal racism in causing health disparities, though, is what's often called structural racism, systemic racism or institutional racism. And those terms have distinct meanings for people who study this area closely, but for our purposes, I'll simply group them together as structural racism. And the key idea here is that society's laws, policies, economics, and institutions can be structured in a way that disadvantages people of color, right? It's not simply that people are behaving badly or acting based on implicit biases. It's that the way that systems are set up can hold groups of people back, even if those systems appear to treat people the same regardless of race. Now, a metaphor may be helpful here. One of my favorite phrases from any Supreme Court opinion is the phrase built-in headwinds. Chief Justice Berger used the phrase way back in 1971 to describe how some practices used by employers to decide whom to hire could have the effect of disadvantaging Black applicants, even if the practice made no reference to race. This case was the first to hold that practices that on their face are neutral with respect to race, but that have a disproportionately negative impact on Black people, 
could violate employment discrimination laws. Now, in describing these practices as creating built-in headwinds, Chief Justice Berger was using the phrase metaphorically. But its literal origin came back to my mind when I was fortunate to get away from the Pittsburgh winter to spend um, a week in South Carolina a while back. And while I was there, we rented bikes and decided to ride them on the beach one day. Now, when we started riding, I felt like I could go forever. But when we turned around, I immediately struggled just to move along slowly. There was a brisk wind that day, a wind that I wasn't even conscious of when it was at my back. But once I turned around and started riding into the headwind, it slowed my progress in a way that was obvious. And so structural racism can be thought of as the various kinds of powerful built-in headwinds that people of color face in society. People who are trying to make progress against the headwinds of structural racism feel them keenly. But people who don't face them, like white people like me, may not perceive them at all. Similarly, structural ableism can be thought of as the various kinds of built-in headwinds that disabled people face in society. So moving away from this metaphor, um, what are a couple of concrete examples? Well, I'll just give you two. An example of structural ableism in healthcare is the prevalence of medical office equipment that is not accessible to people who use wheelchairs. Um, in the context of structural racism in healthcare, we can look at the fact that Medicaid, the public health insurance program for low-income Americans, pays doctors notoriously low rates for treating Medicaid enrollees, which discourages many doctors from accepting those patients. Because Black people who earn less than white people in the U.S. are disproportionately enrolled in Medicaid, the program's low payment rates help create disparities in Black people's ability to access medical care. That idea that structures can be unjust and discriminatory is also important to another key point, which involves the intersection of Blackness and disability. Basically, the idea of intersectionality is that to fully appreciate a person's experience and for the law to ensure that people are not unjustly disadvantaged, it's essential to consider the combined effects of multiple aspects of a person's identity. But the intersection of blackness and disability has received relatively little attention, either empirically by health researchers or in discussions um, of an advocacy around health justice. There's just a lot we don't really know about the intersection of blackness and disability. We do know though that in the US, you, disability is typically more prevalent among black people than among white people. As this graphic from the CDC shows, approximately one in four black people in the US have a disability compared with one in five among white people. And so why haven't researchers and activists paid more attention to this intersection? So there are a couple of reasons I'd like to suggest, right? Why both racial justice advocates and disability Adv rights advocates may have kind of looked the other way. So from the racial justice perspective, racial justice advocates are contending with a long history in which dominant white society has associated blackness with biological inferiority, incapacity, and disability. Black people's supposed inferiority uh, supplied white people with arguments in for enslaving, disenfranchising, and subordinating black people. In short, white people have historically weaponized disability against black people. For that reason, many black people have attached a special stigma to disability. In addition, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute, black disabled people have often felt alienated from what might be referred to as the mainstream disability rights movement and marginalized within the academic field of disability studies. So many black folks have reasons um, that they don't feel kinship with the mainstream disability rights movements. What about disability rights advocates? Why haven't they paid more attention to black people with disabilities? And to start with, for much of its history, the disability rights movement has had predominantly white leadership, leading the social worker and disability justice activist, Melissa Thompson, to create the hashtag disability to white in 2016. 
I surmise that one of the reasons um, that leaders of the disability rights movement, and there may be many reasons, may not have paid as much attention to Black people with disabilities in their work is that doing so may have highlighted some um, limitations of the disabilities rights movements. So what do I mean by that? Right. Although the research remains limited, it seems highly likely that disabilities more frequent and earlier appearance among Black people is attributable to unjust social, economic, and political conditions that are the product of the kind of structural races, uh, racism, the kind of built-in headwinds I've been talking about. Scholars coined the term emergent disability to describe how disabling conditions multiply in communities experiencing poverty or disadvantage. disadvantage. Much disability among Black people likely fits within this category of emergent disability. Examples are easy to identify. The children in Flint, Michigan, who acquired learning disabilities after being exposed to lead in their drinking water. The Black Americans with diabetes, who disproportionately lose limbs to amputation, often because they face barriers to accessing medical care to diagnose and manage the disease. The victims of gun violence, living in communities of concentrated poverty where systemic, systematic disinvestment has largely eliminated opportunity and left illegal activity to fill the void. The point that I'm trying to make is that for many black disabled people, more so than for white disabled people, disability has its origins in inequitable social and economic circumstances. And that means that people who are black and disabled may face layers of injustice and exclusion. Because of their disability, they may face barriers to full participation in society. But in many cases, having that disability may be chalked up to racial injustices that persist in the U.S. And in those cases, the wins of the disability rights movement aren't enough. Think of the mother of a child in Flint, Michigan, right, whose child has been dis intellectually disabled by lead poisoning. Good special education services for that child are vitally important, but they're not enough to make the mother feel like justice has been satisfied. Or think about the black, the middle-aged black man who lost a foot to amputation because he had trouble getting in to see a doctor and managing his, his condition appropriately. Having an, an accessible examination table will be important when he gets in to see a doctor, but it's not enough. When a person's impairment results from unjust social structures, the accommodations and policy adaptations historically sought by disability rights the disability rights movement, while valuable, aren't adequate to fully redress the injustice experienced. So I think all of this suggests some explanations for the historically arm's length relationship between the movements for racial justice and disability rights. But I think that greater attention to that intersection and efforts towards intersectional partnerships are important and can be valuable. Really, at its core, the choice to emphasize intersectionality is a moral commitment. Justice-promoting initiatives that fail to consider intersectional lives risk leaving behind persons who face multiple sources of disadvantage, and those are often the people who are most marginalized. Sometimes those persons may be marginalized even within a social movement by relatively privileged persons within that movement, the leaders of that movement, who may be keenly aware of the disadvantage they experience by virtue of one part of their identity, but may be oblivious to the privilege that they experience by other parts of their identity. And centering the multiple aspects of each person's identity may help mitigate this intra-movement marginalization. So when we are thinking about Blackness and disability, the idea of centering multiple aspects suggest we should understand Black people as a group, as a coalition of disabled and non-disabled Black people. And we should think about non and think of disabled people as a group, as a coalition of white and Black disabled people, along with other disabled people of color. 
So this reconceptualization moves disabled Black people away from the periphery of both the anti-racism movement and the disability rights movements and resituates them centrally at the point of overlap between the two groups. It helps us to view organized identity groups as potential coalitions waiting to be formed. To wrap up my lecture today, I want to note some a few encouraging signs um, that both medicine and law are beginning to front, confront structural ableism in healthcare particularly. First, from the medicine and public health side, just in the past year, Leading U.S. medical journals like the New England, New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA have included articles with titles like Structural Ableism, Essential Steps for Abolishing Disability and Justice. One article titled Revising NIH's Mission Statement to Remove Ableist Language contrasts the current mission statement of the NIH, which refers to seeking fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, length, and life and reduce illness and disability to a proposed revision, which recasts that as focusing on seeking fundamental knowledge to optimize health and prevent or reduce illness for all people. So the real key part of this change in the proposal is to remove language that some view as perpetuating ableist beliefs that disabled people are somehow flawed and need to be fixed by doctors. The NIH is currently considering public input on this proposed revision, so you can comment if you wish. The law also may be on the cusp of acknowledging the distinctive ways that disability discrimination occurs in healthcare settings. In September 2023, the Office for Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services issued proposed regulations updating the application of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act to healthcare services. So Section 504 prohibits disability discrimination by recipients of federal funding. And because federal money goes to so many different healthcare providers and insurers, basically it's going to cover almost the entire industry. The proposed Regulations are extensive, more than 100 pages in the Federal Register, but I'll note just, note just two aspects of them. One, the proposed rules would, for the first time, establish enforceable accessibility standards for medical diagnostic equipment, for examination tables, and for scales for weighing patients. This would be a very big concrete step towards addressing pervasive barriers to receipt of effective health care for people with disabilities. The second point I'll highlight is that the proposed rule seeks to address head on the attitudinal barriers that people with disabilities often face when seeking medical care. Think back to the story of Bill Peace and the doctor at 2 a.m. In, in, in the morning. This would pro provision would prohibit limiting or denying medical treatment when denial is based on bias, bias or stereotypes about a patient's disability, and it would also prohibit denials based on a judgment that a disabled person will be a burden on others because of their disability or that their life has less value or is not worth living. These are also just proposals right now, but to my mind, they represent promising steps steps taken through the legal system to address the many inequities that people with disabilities face in the healthcare system. So I'll wrap up now, and I'm, I apologize for, for going so long, but I just want to close by suggesting the broader value of paying attention to health justice. In my book, I really focus on health justice for people with disabilities and Black people and people who are both Black and disabled. But I think that one thing we've learned um, from the success of the disability rights movement is that when we look at opportunities to provide um, mechanisms to address injustice experienced by a particular group, it can have broad benefits across society. And so I would point to the so-called curb cut effect, which points out how programs or laws designed specifically to benefit a vulnerable group ultimately benefit society more broadly. And I expect that many policies or initiatives to increase health equity for Black and disabled people would have the effect of benefiting the health of many other people as well. And this isn't just about doing what's right. 
It's also about doing what makes sense financially, because from a purely financial perspective, our society suffers huge losses as a result of lost productivity and the additional cost of addressing medical problems too late among groups that experience health disparities. An analysis published in 2018 estimated that eliminating racial health disparities in the U.S. would result in a $135 billion increase in gross domestic product each year. So fundamentally, promoting health justice for Black people, disabled people, and others who experience health disparities doesn't necessarily entailing harming persons and groups that have already been living relatively longer and healthier lives. Health is not a zero-sum game. The message is clear, I think. Our well-being is connected. And we should learn from the pandemic that, as noted health justice scholar Dana Bowen Matthew, who kindly blurbed my book, um, puts it, structural inequality threatens the health of our entire population, not just the health of the poor. Or to adapt an often quoted warning from Dr. King, Health injustice anywhere is a threat to health everywhere. And to close, I would just frame that more positively. Health justice is good for everyone. Thank you. So um, I know some students have classes to go to or faculty members may as well, but we have time, I think, for a few questions, if anyone has one. Yeah. I wonder if your thoughts on the fact that the disparity based on skin tone is black people, because I think black people as a whole. However, as a black male person who has fair skin, oh, has fair skin, I often don't uh, experience the same disparities as my peers who have darker skin than I do. Um, yeah. The short answer is no. I didn't focus on the colorism either. Uh, so the question was whether in, in um, working on the book, I had looked at some of the disparities or differences in treatment um, in terms of people, Black people who have lighter skin tone um, may receive more favorable treatment than other Black people who have darker skin tone. And so there's, there's a lot of study about um, colorism within the Black community and also within society more broadly and how Black people with darker skin tones tend to receive um, more discrimination. And my short answer was that in, in the book, I didn't focus on that. I think it would be a really interesting, um, I didn't I didn't even see any studies of it, but I wasn't looking for it. So it would be a really interesting um, kind of experiment to see just whether or not, when you look specifically at health disparity, um, whether that's um, as demonstrated in the research. Um, yeah. So, several years ago, there was an article in the Pittsburgh Post Gazette where the writer was looking at the differences between black and white health care. And his conclusion was that black individuals should move out of Pittsburgh because that would assure greater longevity. So my question is, how are we doing in Pittsburgh? So there was um, there was a study that came out um, no, it's like three or four years ago now. I don't, I don't know if you remember. It's, it's like the state of Black history, and it really does look at the difference in experience, not just in health, but across a lot of different kind of axes between the experiences based on race and ethnicity. And it did show um, that, you know, particularly for Black women, Pittsburgh is not a healthy place to live compared to other similarly sized cities. I think that. Certainly, the health systems in Pittsburgh are very aware of that and have programs trying to address within their systems those disparities. One of the things I, I talk a lot about in the book, but really didn't talk about today, is that certainly those kinds of um, health system factors that contribute to poor outcomes are important. But as important, and that be more important, are what can be referred to as the social determinants of health. So things like education levels, things like housing, things like neighborhood health, food deserts, those are all areas that really, if we are going to make, you know, if they say it's the most livable city for everyone, that we need to be paying attention. 
In the story you began with, with Mr. Hickson, uh, I'm just curious if there was a hospital ethics committee involved in the decision to withhold care, withdraw care? I am not, uh, in the accounts that I read, there were um, not references to a hospital ethics committee being involved. Um, there were, there was a lawsuit that was brought afterwards, and I never saw any report in one Texas has an interesting law about single medical care um, that is um, fairly empowering for physicians um, who seek to withdraw care of the John Brown. Okay, I'm sorry, one last one. <laughs> um, so, when you dug into the death rates of the Black babies decreasing when, you, when they were being taken care of Black doctors, um, did you do any research on like why that doesn't go more across the board in healthcare in general? Um, does it come down to more of an economic issue now that we're seeing like a more diverse group of doctors and healthcare professionals? So, so to be clear, I did not do the research that led to that finding. That was research done by medical researchers, and and there there is research in, for adults as well that show that it's what's referred to as health concordance. Um, between doctor and patient can lead to better health outcomes. And, and much of the thinking is that there's a greater level of trust. There may be greater likelihood of seeking care, of both being fully disclosing of your condition, um, and actually listening to the provider. And the provider may be less likely to discriminate as well. That's an area where there's still a lot of concern about underrepresentation of Black people, and particularly Black men, as well as the disabled people in the medical profession and other healthcare professions. So that's a real area of um, challenge, particularly with some recent Supreme Court decisions that limit the ability in higher education to um, pursue affirmative action. So on that cheery note, <laughs> but in a, an area to work on, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you all very much. In introducing Dean Crossley, I hypothesized that if her book was must read, uh, her lecture would be must hear. Uh, and certainly as the minutes have passed uh, and she delivered this thought provoking presentation, uh, you made that hypothesis a reality. Uh, so thank you again for all that you have done for the Thornburg Forum and the disability lecture in particular over the years. And thanks for this very, very special edition today, Mary. Let's again thank you. Thank you.